Hi to me. So welcome to another episode of Meet Me in My Corner. I am Dr. K and I am your host. Can you believe we're on our sixth episode? I don't know if you guys are getting tired of listening to just my voice. Um, I am working on getting you guests and so forth. But for now, you still have me, okay? Um, And hopefully you are enjoying the ride. So to get into this episode, I want to tell you a story. In the year 2023, which was last year, I was just about to complete my community service when it dawned on me that I actually will be unemployed and I don't have enough funds. But I was very lucky in that I had an extra stream of income with my content creation. So I was really desperate at that time. (laughs) I needed all the money I could get. So anytime I saw the subject line in my emails written potential collaboration or paid collaboration, you know, I would get so excited. So there was a time where I was approached by an agency I firstly had never worked with and they were asking me to consider to partner with a brand that they were working with. I was really excited. The figure was also something I was interested in because I needed money. (laughs) But something about this brand made me feel a little hesitant. So I had seen the brand on my social media pages, had not really paid much attention to it, but I'd seen it. Um, So because I didn't really subscribe to the brand, I decided to then do some research. So I firstly started with doing research on the product that they were promoting. So it was a supplement that claims that your skin will become brighter. Um, So I research the active ingredient just to see if there's anything that ethically would put me in a lot of hot water but also um, I wanted to see if there would be a conflict of interest in any way because being a medical doctor you know especially in the content creation space is you know quite difficult and there's a lot of intricacies involved especially when it comes to products Um, that somebody is consuming um, for what would look like health reasons. I then go onto the website of the actual brand. And guys, when I say I was flabbergasted, that I was. The imagery on the website was jarring. Okay, so they had this photo (laughs) and it was a before and after. And it was pretty obvious that the after was um, photoshopped. I don't know. Do I say allegedly here? I don't know. I just don't want to catch myself in court. Anyway, so the after looked photoshopped. Let me rather say that. And what the imagery said to me, how it read to me, is that if you use this product, you'll become brighter. And you know what brighter means. And brighter is better. But what it looked like is that brighter is lighter and lighter is better. So I send these comments to the agency and I just tell them that, you know what, I'm on a journey and I have actually used my platform to speak about colorism. And I don't think I want to catch myself on the wrong side of the narrative Or on the side that I don't want to be a part of. Let me rather not say wrong or right, you know. So I just don't want to be a part of a narrative um, that pushes people to do something that I wouldn't actually do. So this person from the agency says that no, they'll send my comments to the brand and they'll get back to me. So they get back to me, I think within a week. And they're like, listen, um, the brand was so 
shocked that that was your interpretation of the imagery um that's definitely not what they want to get across so they are working on the website and they're looking to make changes to ensure that this is not the messaging that is going to you know the consumer or potential consumer and i won't lie to you i then decided to consider it and we got to a point where we were almost at a point where i think i was about to sign the contract but something made me very hesitant so i discuss it with a fellow content creator who's also in the medical space and is also a dark skinned woman and she was instantly like don't do it you are a reliable voice you have built a very strong community around you please don't in any way betray what you have and also don't put what you've built into jeopardy um your feelings are true so don't invalidate yourself don't gaslight yourself even if they change the imagery it won't change what the product will do so i almost allow the people pleasing me to get away with it you know and make me sign a contract because i felt like we had gone down like a very long path and we had so many back and forths but i didn't i called um the person no actually i think she called me and we had a very long discussion um this person from the agency and she was sad because they said they really wanted me but she understood where i was coming from and she would definitely respect it um and yeah that was it and a few months later i started to see that they were actually getting a lot of flack online and i was so glad honey that i did not allow my desperation to put me in a bad situation <laughs> um so yeah that was that um but what i definitely know is that if they had contacted me 2 years prior and before the birth of my child i probably would have fallen into that trap and i would be speaking another tune okay so yes today we're speaking about colorism it's about time okay i am a dark skinned woman um so i have a lot of experiences and there's certain things i just want to share with you so i was first introduced to colorism obviously as a child as anybody else is our community is well known for being colorist and that is the black community i know there are other communities that also are colorist so i grew up in a home where everybody looked like me everybody was dark skinned so that should have been a conducive foundation for me to have a very strong and solid self esteem And I say that because when I compare myself to a friend of mine of whom I've had this conversation with at length we view ourselves very differently and yet we had a similar upbringing and we are both on the deeper side of skin tone in terms of black girls and you know when she looks at dark skin she looks at it very positively whereas I didn't So then what led me to be negative about my skin tone so as i was growing up i was always told that i resemble my mom and for some time i was very excited and very happy to know that because my mom then felt like an enigma and to me she was like the best thing to ever happen she was a celebrity in my eyes and that was because she was always traveling she was never really emotionally available um and now that i am similar age to what she was at that time i totally understand why she was who she was at that time um another thing is that my mom was pretty successful in terms of like having possessions and her work and so forth 
So when she came into a room, she really commanded the room. Like I used to feel like my mom could stop traffic. Okay. She wasn't your typical, um, you know, girl next door look, uh, but she was very fashionable. Um, her shoe game was on fleek and I was just really, really proud of my mom. I still am, by the way, I think she's a brilliant human being. So when she had the divorce, um, well, after she had the divorce, she then, um, also stopped traveling as much. I think things changed up at her work, which meant that now we were spending more time with her. And then I started to get to know her and I realized that my mom had, you know, things that she was dealing with that made it difficult for her to love herself and she constantly spoke down about herself which translated to me then having a very warped idea of how I looked because as I said before I looked very much like her so now let's go into what led my mom to get to this point my mom grew up in a home where she was the darker skin sibling and we all know how black communities or black families treat the dark child they're always scrubbed the most they are termed with very derogatory slurs and they are very rarely celebrated they are always looked at as the menace and they're always ignored okay So she was darker skinned because she had a different father to her other siblings. So she was the eldest child, which is another layer to this whole thing. Because we all know older children really go through a lot. The first child, the first child, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you are the eldest child, I am so sorry. I know you guys go through a lot. So my gran met her father, made her, they had their issues, broke up. And then she actually then found her husband of whom she married, who was fair-skinned and gave her fair-skinned children. Although my aunt is now dark, so yeah, I don't know, it's confusing. But when they were younger, my mom was evidently darker than everybody else. And because she had a different father and she looked more like her father, you know, and had a lot of his features, she felt quite ostracized and sometimes marginalized for that. Um, My mom speaks of, you know, being exposed to so much abuse because of how she looked. Um, She speaks of like constantly trying to run away from home because she was just so sick and tired of being abused as much as she was. And, you know, she wanted to always find a way to find her father's home because she thought that maybe there she'd find people that look more like her and she'd feel safer and at home and so forth. Um, And I even saw it as a child. There was definitely a huge difference to how she was treated compared to other people. I can't imagine living life that way. Um, But yeah, that was her life. She survived it. And you know what? Throughout it all, she was still a good person. And then obviously, she had to deal with society outside of her home, right? And society is not kind to the dark-skinned child. And then she meets my father and... um, My father's also unfaithful towards her and unfaithful towards her with women that look nothing like her, who are fair skinned and just made her feel quite terrible about how she looked. She also then, you know, has relationships or friendships with women that also didn't look like her. I used to feel like those friendships didn't make sense to me. Um, She has a true friendship with somebody else, but there was these friends that she had and Listen, when my mom went through her financial situations, all those people like disappeared. So there were many elements or many factors that made it difficult for my mom to see beauty in herself. So I definitely understand why she then struggled with seeing past our skin tone as well. However, I do need to make it very clear. My mom has always called me beautiful. However, I've always felt that there was a limit to my beauty because of my dark skin. I would feel very celebrated by my mom 
if I used a product which honestly was not for bleaching and I was not intending to use it for bleaching but found to be bleached after using it and I'm talking about like mainstream products that we all are using there's some products out there guys they definitely will bleach you whether you like it or not and you know even like during the winter time when my skin would lighten I found that she was much more kinder and her response to me was a little bit more warmer I have never felt unloved by my mom but I did feel that she was not completely happy with the fact that our skin tone is so deep and I don't think it had to do with her and I actually think it had to do with more of her fear you know of her children experiencing the things that she experienced but luckily I never got marginalized by my mom so obviously I was already protected from that but unfortunately she couldn't protect me from the world and the world wasn't so kind to me, unfortunately. Um, You know, obviously I did have instances or incidents where I would, you know, be put down for my skin tone, Um, but they were very subliminal and not so overtly abusive or overtly discriminatory but I would have them and people would also use weird terms to call me you know even if it was in a loving way it would just be so weird I remember once someone called me marajo a pizza which means the bottom of a pot and I've, I don't know if you've ever seen the bottom of a pot that shit is dark that shit is dark you know um that was actually very disrespectful <laughs> I just <laughs> I need to pause it. That was very disrespectful, right? So this is the kind of things that um, I was exposed to. But now I have to tell you about the most traumatic experience that I had um, that was related to my skin tone. So this happened in 2007. I was 13 years old at that time. I felt so good at that time. I was a prefect at school. I went to a very, very small school. We were very close-knit as a community we really all got along Ah, fine maybe sometimes we didn't get along that well but you know the bullying wasn't like that hectic honestly um but anyway I was a prefect and one of my duties was to score for cricket please don't ask me I don't know how I got that gig I watch cricket now and I just don't understand I just see balls flying I, I, I literally I just don't get it but somehow your girl okay me I was an empire. All right. Um, anyway, so one day I was doing this duty and our school was playing against a school that we actually regularly played against. But for the first time, I actually noticed a certain player or a certain boy. Right. And I was completely smitten over this guy. And when I look back, I actually see that I actually have a type. I really genuinely have a type. So I see this guy. I hand him um, his lunch because that was also part of our duties. You know, we had to score and also give out lunch. And I don't think he found the interaction significant because obviously he was just in his, you know, thoughts and all that stuff. Um, But I remembered it. So our school did not have a high school, but their school did. And it was very common for a lot of the people who graduated from our school to then move on to that school because it was a Catholic school. So, you know, we had the same type of um, values or whatever, whatever. Okay, so it was a similar type of school. So I knew somebody in his school who was a year ahead of him. And I texted her and I was like, girl. I saw this guy today and I really think he is so cute. I would love to have an opportunity to mix it with him. And she was like, yeah, no, sure, definitely do it, right? Um, So she speaks to him and because she knew me and she really, really liked me, um, I think she talked me up. And yeah, we, 
we exchange phone numbers or she gets me his phone number and then we start to mix it. Um, as I said before, he couldn't really recall me, but he could recall that he had seen me, but he couldn't really like picture me. So we hit it off like a house on fire, like guys, conversation on fleek. And I just wanted to remind you, I was 13, right? And because I was 13, because he was something or someone that I paid a lot of attention to, he became a big part of my days, which meant he became a big part of my world. I was super smitten. I was excited. Oh my God, always talking to him. So it then got to a point where we now had to exchange photos. And I can remember how anxious I was. I was at my grand's house. (laughs) I was so anxious. So he sends me a photo of himself, which was a very normal photo, okay? That is the type of photo anybody should send. He was standing by a tree, he's in his shorts, you know, it just looks completely normal. So he obviously expected that he would get the same type of photo. But no, Katlero sends him a photo of a photo. So I took a picture of my school photo. And I took a picture of a specific one because that was the one my mom liked the most. And the reason why she liked it a lot is that, yes, I did look very cute and I was very pretty and it was a very neat photo. But I was very whitewashed in that photo because of the amount of flash they used on me. Okay. Um, So I sent him this photo and he's obviously like, oh, don't you have another photo or whatever? But I think that guy was beyond his years because he was such a gentleman about it and he didn't push. I think he could realize that I was uncomfortable with the whole situation. So he didn't keep pushing. Anyway, um, so then it also gets to a point where we decide that now we need to meet. Like we have to, have to meet. Okay. And we decide to meet on a day where it was going to be a sports day at his school. So it was going to be light, easy, fun. Um, There wasn't going to be a lot of pressure because I think at that time when people used to have dates or like meetups, they would ask their parents to drop them off at the mall and they would go to like a milky lane or whatever and would feel kind of like pressurized, you know. Um, So yeah, this was definitely up my alley. It was great. But guys, when I tell you that I was so stressed to meet this person because I didn't want to lose, um, you know, the fun and the excitement that I had with speaking to him all the time. I was so nervous that I even got a cystic pimple. I've never, ever in my life had anything that big on my face ever. I had never even had a pimple prior to that. Um, And I still even have the scar of that pimple. That's how big and how destructive that pimple was okay luckily for me on the friday just before i have to meet him it actually shrunk but guys i was super excited so in preparation i even made my mom take me to this Ghanaian hairstylist which was my favorite hairstylist he was in sunnyside and he would do the best blowout waves on me you know i didn't know a lot about myself then but one thing i knew like you could never ever fight me on was my hair my hair was the business. Okay. Um, I think I also tricked my mom in getting me an outfit. Was the outfit cute? No, ma'am. What was I wearing? No. (laughs) Why was I wearing a camouflage skirt? And why was I wearing camouflage pumps? And then why did I pair that up with a yellow bright tee, which is a graphic tee, by the way, there was no opportunity of simplicity in this outfit. I think even the skirt had chains and I, I, I do recall that I was wearing fingerless gloves, which till this day, I don't understand why those things exist because why are my palms warm and my fingertips are frozen? What is that? Okay. But I was a skater girl. I said, see you later girl. So I felt really cool. And the other nice part is that Because we were meeting in a sports event, I could come with my friends. So I also got them, you know, to come with me. So the day comes, we go out for the blow wave. 
put my lip gloss on. I think I was experimenting a lot more with makeup then, but nothing like a foundation or anything like that. I, I think I put on liquid eyeshadow on the corner of my eyes. That was it. But I felt really good about myself. So we arrive um, to his school and I hit him up and he tells me that, no, I'm currently still playing hockey because he was an athlete. Okay. Um, so just please wait for me on the grounds near the gate. You might even find my friends there, which will make you feel more comfortable. Oh, excitement, 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 right? But the funniest thing is, and I still recall that feeling now, as soon as I walked onto the grounds, I felt this wave of darkness and I thought it was just like ugh, nerves and maybe it was maybe it actually was okay but I've never felt that feeling ever since that time like that was the first and last time I've ever felt that anyway so my friends and I are walking towards um his friends because my friends actually knew his friends um so they spotted them and then we were walking towards them and as we're walking towards them they start laughing like hyenas, like they're hysterically laughing. They are dead. Okay. We can't actually hear what they're laughing about and we can't pinpoint what it's about. And obviously we feel out of place because I mean, they're all in their sports gear. We're in their school, you know, we're out of our comfort and we're out of our territory. And I mean, also the outfits, were they really giving? No. Okay. So, at that point, I thought they were laughing at our outfits. We're not really discussing. We're just like walking towards them. And honestly, it obviously wasn't like in slow motion. But now when I think about it, it felt like very slow. And as we just about to approach them. So when we're now in earshot of them, but they still haven't noticed that we're in earshot. They start making remarks about me. And they're saying, yo, she's so ugly. Yo, yo, dog. Yo, 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 look at her. She's so dark. Yo, Zimbabwe, you know. Um, and I just want to pause here. If you don't know anything about South Africa, we do have a xenophobia problem. So they were using a xenophobic slur to put me down. So I'm like now thinking back, I wonder if they realized that we heard them or I wonder if they realized that they were as loud as they were, that we could actually catch on to what they were saying. My friends instantly look at me, but like, they didn't even know what to do. Um, and I act like I didn't hear it. I act like it's not happening. Right. And then as we move closer, like where they now can see that, okay, they really are in earshot. They just start to like, you know, snigger to themselves and, um, they're not making the remarks anymore, but I'd already heard it. It had already, you know, cemented in me. I knew that me being here was going to humiliate this person that I cared so much about at that time. I felt so small and so insignificant in that moment. And it's so funny to me because I was someone that was very outspoken then and I could normally like, you know, stand up for myself. I shriveled up and I just stood there and I felt like I just took it, you know, because they kept like, you know, sniggering to themselves, but they weren't making it like that obvious anymore that they're laughing at me, but they just kept laughing. Right. And I know a big part of it was that it was also to humiliate him um, because that's what boys do. Right. Um, he wasn't there at that point, but I know it's just like it's even funnier that he's then going to come there and he's going to be surprised at how ugly I am. Because obviously he had spoken about me. He's obviously also excited about this whole thing. So for them, it was just like comedy goal. Like it was comical as hell. Right. And I'm there, this young 13 year old girl in a skater girl outfit. Right. Just trying to just be a person, just trying to have a beautiful moment or a cool moment. And I've already been cut down to size. So he then comes, um, and they don't make it obvious, you know, and he doesn't even speak to them. He just takes me to the side. And I was just so embarrassed. I was so humiliated. Um, even though he didn't know that this had happened, 
or they had this impression of me, I carried it with me in our conversation. So what I then did is I just acted very meek and I just didn't show him the personality that he was used to. And he was quite puzzled, you know, and he thought there was something wrong with him and there was absolutely nothing wrong with him. Um, and I was fortunate enough that this happened quickly that I was able to contact my mom and she could be on the grounds like within a few minutes. And then we left. So everything was very abrupt. I got bullied and then spoke to him for two seconds and then like I just left, right? And as we were walking towards the car, I remember my friends have felt very helpless. Like it's like they didn't know what to do. I could see that they were very annoyed and they were visibly annoyed with those guys. They were so annoyed, but they were also not the confrontational type. I was the confrontational type, right? And I think because I didn't say anything, they took my lead on it. And we just kept quiet. And I'm so glad that they respected that I really didn't want to speak about it at the time. I'm so proud of the friends that I had at that point and I actually still am very close to one of the girls so we get into the car my mom could see something is off um but she was still not in a position where she could have those conversations with me so she just let us slide we dropped off my friends and then I got home and I just cried I bawled my eyes out but I didn't want to tell her what was wrong so I don't even know what story I made up but I didn't want to you know, show her that she was right, you know, that my skin will definitely limit me and will threaten my desirability. So I get on my phone and I remember how anxious I was feeling because I was waiting for him to reject me. But as soon as I got on my phone, I realized that he still hadn't texted me. He just said, well, he had, and he just said, hi, it was very nice to meet you. Um, so, and then he sent me a message saying that he was very sorry about how my friends treated me. Cause obviously then they told him, you know, so I said, no, it's fine. It's okay. Um, you know, and because I didn't want that humiliation to now extend to our conversation on the phone, I decided to then be the one that rejects him. <laughs> So I then friend zoned him and I'm like, oh, I don't think we have the chemistry that we thought we would have. Um, but you know, um, there's this girl in our school who's super pretty and she did genuinely was guys. She genuinely still is very beautiful girl. Um, she was a light skin petite girl and you can imagine small light skin, everybody dotes on her, right? Even our principal, it was the weirdest thing. Our principal was Italian and even he was a colorist. They treated her differently to all of us. Okay. It was very evident. So because I liked this boy so much, I felt that he deserved to have something way better than me. And let me not humiliate him any further. Let me step away. Let me send him um, this girl's phone number. Let me try facilitate them to match up. And I think they did, or I think they spoke or whatever. Um, And I will never be angry or look down on him for you know taking up that option because he was 13 (laughs) right um so then after that um it kind of died down I act like it didn't happen by the way um I somehow got over it but I didn't really I was just avoidant until it came a point where we now graduated and there were people from my school going to that school. And I remember in the beginning of my grade eight year, right? So the next year I was like sitting at the edge of my seat, hoping that the situation would not come up again and re-traumatize me. And did I not have losers of ex-peers who found the need to go onto my wall and actually re-traumatize me and remind me of that day. So apparently, you know, when they went to the school, you know, obviously people discuss things, whatever. They, the other boys who made fun of me brought it up and this one guy 
and he was a bully even at school. He thought it was so funny. So he put it on my wall and it was so traumatizing, guys. <laughs> so I even deleted my Facebook and I changed my name. I won't lie to you. I did. I think I even called myself Optimus Prime. It was so embarrassing. It took me so long to take that off. But I was that embarrassed and that traumatized by that situation that I didn't want it to carry on, you know, following me. But whether I liked it or not, it did follow me. And it really shaped how I viewed myself in the context of other people. So how I viewed myself in the world. That experience made me feel so small that it took a lot for me to feel human again. I felt that I had to always justify my existence and to prove my humanity. And in doing so, I felt that I needed to always do these elaborate things, you know, um, the way I dress, um, the way I do my hair. Um, and then also it went into how I view myself with opportunities, you know, I had to achieve a lot. I had to do so many other things so that I could detract from my skin tone or from my appearance so that people would not feel like the experience is cheapened by having me around. I felt that I had to create merit for my worth. And, you know, Colorism is a very difficult thing to help people understand if they have never been through it because it's something that people like to act like it doesn't really exist or they think that it ends on the surface. And I want to give you some receipts just to help you understand how deep colorism can actually be and how it can really affect someone's life. Okay. So I was reading on the Harvard Business Review an article on how colorism affects women at work. It was published on April 7, 2023 by Rushika Tulshan. I'm sorry if I'm saying that name wrong. Okay. So in this article, she writes a story uh, about Mira. Mira is a lady who moved to the United States from India to take on a role at a large consulting firm. So when she got there, she was very thrilled to see another woman that was Indian on her team. As she navigated a new country, a new workspace, as well as a new culture, she was hopeful that working with someone with identities in common would help her build trust and advance her leadership on the team. But soon she was surprised to find that her Indian colleague and other members of the team would ignore her or look away when she talked in meetings. She was routinely left off important emails and excluded from discussions. She was puzzled, but when she asked her manager for feedback, they said she was performing at the highest levels. The final straw came a few years later when her manager asked a junior team member to make a client presentation for a project Mira had been leading. I spent years doubting myself, wondering what it was about me that wasn't acceptable or professional, as I saw other women with similar identities and skills as me progress. There was only one explanation that made sense, she said, her darker skin color. I was so shocked, honestly in denial, until I couldn't ignore it. I thought discrimination based on dark skin was an issue I'd escaped when I left India. But in the US, at a top company, it had followed me right back. The article goes on to then explain that research shows Mira's experience with colorism is far from isolated. A new report from The Catalyst evaluated data from 2,734 women from the marginalized racial and ethnic groups from the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and South Africa. The study authors found that 51% of women from those groups have experienced racism in their current workplace. For women with darker skin tones, that can go high as 69%. 
They then also go on to explain that skin tone can be a bigger determinant of whether someone gets a job than their educational background. According to the University of Georgia, the researcher Matthew Harrison found that even in the United States alone, one study found that black Americans with lighter skin have higher socioeconomic status and tend to marry people with such, leading the authors to conclude that the impact of skin color or shade was as impactful as race in American socioeconomic status. Now, on that part, okay, the socioeconomic status, as we all know, colorism is basically the legacy of colonialism, where black people were further segregated um, due to their skin color, right? So the darker skinned people would be found in the fields, um, and they would be seen as lesser than. So they would also obviously have less opportunities to, you know, have more than what they had. And then the lighter skinned blacks who were sometimes, not all the time, a product of white men raping black women were given more esteemed positions like house slaves. And this created a true friction and a true divide between the two types of people on the medium medium medium.com they speak about how after emancipation occurred in 1863 blacks created their own social divide system by creating elite societies and schools in which you had to pass tests in order to be accepted such as the blue veins or paper bag tests just imagine that these skin color based assessments help to expand colorism in the general public creating movements like team light skin and team dark skin um in a 1990 study by hughes and hertel findings depicted that light-skinned blacks were more likely to have a higher education and salaries than their darker skinned counterparts okay and then let's also speak about how then this also plays out in media um, in terms of socioeconomic status, you can see, even if you watch your Real Housewives of um, whatever, you know, the, the, the franchise and the basketball wives, it's always the racially ambiguous girls that are always chosen that are with these high paid um, um, ballers or these rappers and so forth. And I can now understand why Lil Kim said what she said in 2000 in a Newsweek article. Okay. I remember I read this in 2016 and I'm so glad I could find it for you guys because it shaped a lot for me and it made me feel validated in the things that I was going through. So this article was put out after a photo of Lil Kim surfaced on social media and it was after she took a hiatus right from social media and she was really unrecognizable and she was definitely very light in skin okay apparently she still denies that she bleached her skin and that's her prerogative um but they had an insert in there that can explain why she would have done this right um and they took this from her interview in 2000 with newsweek And she had said, I have low self-esteem and I always have. Guys always cheated on me with women who were European looking. You know, the long hair type. Really beautiful woman that left me thinking, how can I compete with that? Being a regular black girl wasn't good enough. And I think I had read this article because it was on Twitter. Because I remember a discourse happening on Twitter where people were talking about like bleaching and all that stuff. And her specifically bleaching. And I can't remember who said this, but they even put up a picture um, of rappers at the Grammys and literally all of them were standing next to a racially ambiguous or a very fair skinned woman. And this person then said, do you think that being exposed to something like this would make you feel comfortable with how you look? So I understand where little Kim is coming from. And we also know she was being abused by Biggie, right? And she was very in love with Biggie. They had a relationship and she was always on the side. Um, And he then chose Faith, who is very fair skinned. So being constantly dropped um, and being left for the fair skinned woman, I can understand why she found herself in that position and she thought that that would be the best solution. And also, if this is also affecting your bag, like if other people are chosen above you, girl yeah i get it 
So speaking also on media, right, there has been a lot of negligence that we can see in the media. And there's been messaging that really, really projects and protects colorism. Okay, so think about shows like Girlfriends. And I used to love that show. And I'm always told that I resemble Tony. And I always used to fight that. And I don't know why, like looking back now, um, I don't know why then I thought it was necessary to fight it. But now I understand why I was fighting it. Tony is a beautiful woman. Okay. In the context of the show, it didn't feel that way. Um, And also her being depicted as the dumb black woman even though she had a high socioeconomic status because she was, you know, dating like black white men and all that stuff. I just don't think I wanted to be associated with that. And even being told that I looked like her made me feel that I would be associated with everything that she encompassed on that show. And we also look at Maya. Yes, Maya was not completely like not very dark, but she was darker toned than, um, what's her name? Why I'm forgetting her name. Who's the lead again? Um, ugh, I'm forgetting the lead now, but anyway, she was more deeper in tone than that person. And she had this chaotic life. She had deadbeat dad issue or deadbeat baby daddy issues who was in jail. And this is something that constantly gets depicted in our TV shows, right? Where the main character will always be a light skinned woman and the dark skin lady will always be a supporting character and where the dark skin girl will always be depicted as the sassy black woman or the strong black woman and um or she'll be seen as a damn black woman or seen as less attractive as compared to her lighter skin counterpart and this is something that i don't care who says what but it translates even into reality it is not only like something that, you know, we just watch and we switch off the TV and that's it. It really does follow us into every room that we go into. And I remember even telling my partner that I felt like, you know, being dark skinned has followed me even into opportunities where I would sabotage myself because I felt like I'm not worthy of it, you know, or where I felt like people are seeing me as less than Um, what they are looking for. Now, let's talk about how colorism even can affect you medically. (laughs) And this is a big thing because your health is everything, right? And it's so sad I'm going to share what I'm about to share with you because I didn't even pay that much attention to it. So I remember there was a time um, where it became very evident that black women were being faced with a lot of medical negligence. Um, their pain and their symptoms were being ignored or overlooked. And that was also the time where people were like, we need to stop, you know, allowing people to portray us as a strong black woman because this is where it will also affect us. So there's an article that I read that really opened up my eyes. So there was a lady who went to the ER with her mom. It was during the COVID times. She's a black woman, that is. And she was told to leave the hospital and return if her mom's lips appear blue, which would mean that she's cyanosed and that her oxygen levels are critically low. So she requires oxygen support, um, which was standard, um, standard practice at that time, because, you know, you wanted to manage, um, crowds and so forth and manage, um, the, basically the pandemic. Okay. So you, we couldn't uh, admit everybody at that time. So I can understand why this practitioner would have given these um, instructions. However, she then speaks of how she felt so confused as to why a doctor would say that to her, because looking at her mom, there's no way that she would have evidently blue lips, which means that she would actually miss this and there would be no way for her to find out how severe her mom's case was. And the doctor couldn't give her another, you know, 
um, way of looking at um, her oxygen levels being low. And in the whole article, they show you, you know, dark skinned people to help you see how symptoms would show up in them. So then they also show that a lot of the books that we read as medics, you know, in preparation to go into clinical work, um, have very little content published to depict how symptoms look in darker skin. Okay. Um, and I'm not just saying darker skin in in terms of just, um, you know, dark skin, black people, I'm talking about like darker skin. So in the spectrum of skin, like from white to black, like there was mostly white skin and fair skin that was being shown in these textbooks, which obviously means that if you're not aware of how something looks, you don't know how to pick it up. You don't know how to manage it, which will then lead to medical negligence as well as misdiagnosis. And I personally went through this because when my child had a lesion and she is actually fair skinned, Um, but she's not dark skinned. I struggled to diagnose the severity of her lesion because I couldn't see any child or any example that looked like her that could help me really ascertain what was happening. Gabrielle Union also speaks about this. Um, I just hate that she thought it was a flaw in her motherhood. So she um, I, I don't know if she was interviewed, I don't know what happened, but she spoke about how she was overly traumatized by Kavea's first nappy rash because it looked very different to what she had seen prior, which was, you know, a red inflamed bum. Her child was actually inflamed. It's just that her inflammation looked like hypopigmented lesions. So she thought her child was dying. That's how traumatized she was. And I feel that that trauma was unnecessary for her to go through because there's not enough examples of dark skin and symptoms on us in textbooks, even on the internet. And I wish I could tell her that it has nothing to do with her motherhood because even if she tried to look for it, um, she would never have found it. And it's so sad. And I hope this makes you realize that even in that, it is dehumanizing because health is for us all. Health does not discriminate. It will affect all of us. So why are we looking at it with such a limited lens? Why are we not depicting how conditions will affect all kinds of people? And it's obviously happening because certain types of people are not being regarded as people. And I need to speak about this regard part, okay? I need to speak about how, you know, as a dark-skinned person, you will feel so unseen. I didn't think that even in motherhood, this is something that I would struggle with, right? And what I'm about to say might sound so absurd to you. You're going to be like, what? No, man, you're being dramatic. Please, I promise you, it is... A feeling that I have and I have discussed this with other moms that have the same experience and they understand why I feel this way so when my child was born she looked quite racially ambiguous but at some point she did actually finally you know (laughs) grow into her features um her father is fair-skinned he's not very fair-skinned like he doesn't look like Beyonce um, but he is fair-skinned so in the beginning she did actually resemble him quite a lot Um, But as she started growing up, it was obvious, well, obvious to me and obvious to him and people who see me that she looks like me, right? And I used to get so annoyed because people would, and they still do, would fight me on this and be like, no, she doesn't look like you. I just don't know who she looks like. Um, I can see she doesn't look like your partner, but I don't know who she looks like. And I'll just be like, because she looks like me. And I realized that because people were not seeing me and the only thing that they were hung up on is the skin tone. And because my child has a skin tone that is deemed as desirable and I have a skin tone that is not deemed as desirable, they did not want me to benefit from her desirability. So for some odd reason, they would ignore that our features are actually the same and they are alike. 
to a point where sometimes I do a double take every time I fetch my child from crash. I'm just like, it's so wild. She looks so like me. And they would constantly fight me on this. I'd just be like, why are you fighting me on this? And my partner would always have to jump in and help them understand that Gatlao really looks like this person. So for them, they didn't understand why this thing was so deep to me. Like why, like it used to really annoy me that they're not seeing that she looks like me. But I just felt like I was being ignored, even with something that actually belongs to me. Like, okay, my child doesn't belong to me. We'll speak about that. But I mean, I hope you understand what I'm saying. She's something that I created. But even with that, they don't want me to even have that, you know. Um, And they're willing to say that I don't know who she looks like um, because it's obvious that she doesn't look like my partner. But they're unwilling to see me in her. And this then became a thing and I spoke about it. And I also then realized that I'm still struggling with, you know, my skin tone and all that stuff. And I really want to break the cycle, right? Because my daughter looks like me and her skin is going to deepen in, in tone. I don't want her to have the same experience that I had growing up. Where even at home, I didn't feel like, you know my skin tone was something that I could be proud of. Um, But I also have to put in something that Gabriel Union says here. And she said that you can love what you see in the mirror, but you can't self-esteem yourself out of how the world sees you. So as much as I would love to do all this work, you know, to pour love into her, but I know for certain I can't do the work that needs to be done in the world for her, you know, to be seen. That's if though her skin does deepen, but I'm going to do my hardest to really pour into her. I also want to speak about Gabriel Union. If you're a dark skinned woman, you have to make sure that you read her first book. She has a chapter on being dark skinned that revolutionized a lot for me. And I'm not saying this to be dramatic. It was so beneficial to my journey with loving myself and getting to know myself. I struggled to articulate my experience and reading it in a book was so validating that I wept, like I cried. It was so awesome to hear that my trauma is not invalid, that my trauma is not made up by myself, that it's not that I'm, you know, self-obsessed or self-absorbed, That I'm only thinking that people only care about my skin tone. That it's an actual true thing. That all these microaggressions are real things that have happened to me. She also helped me identify an insecurity that I had in my relationship. So when I started dating my partner, I constantly used to fight with him about him not checking up on me enough. I didn't feel as though he cared enough about my safety. And I made the mistake of attacking and challenging his masculinity when it actually had nothing to do with that and what it had to do with is the fact that I felt like you know my femininity was not being seen but what I didn't realize is that I was the one that threatened um, you know myself having this experience of being doted over and being protected and that's because as a response to the trauma that I've experienced as a dark-skinned woman I've done a lot to equip myself and to make it seem like I'm a strong black woman. And I put that in air quotes because we're stopping that, right? We are definitely stopping that. And I've never given him leeway to feel that he can protect me because I always feel I'm always portraying or, you know, showing up as though I've got it all together. So he was very confused that I had this need. And he'd constantly say to me, but dude, you are someone that I know you'll be fine. You are so responsible. You do all these things, you know, you, you, you're very well aware of everything around you. I don't feel that I need to do this. And it would grate me. It would really make me so angry. Like you need to care for me as a man, you know? And it's like, I do care for you. I do. I definitely do. I'm like, no, I feel like you see me as one of your boys. Like, girl, I'm not doing the things that I do for my boys for you. Like the things that I do for you, I'd never do for my boys, you know? And after reading her book, I started to realize that this was actually an insecurity that stemmed from the fact that I've never felt, you know, 
looked at as someone that someone would want to protect. I've never felt feminine enough, you know. I've never felt doted over and I've wanted that. I do. I do. And sharing this with him was very important when I finally made the realization of where this was coming from. And obviously I had to apologize. And also sharing with him my experience of being a dark-skinned woman was so, so liberating. And it helped him, I think, understand me better. Um, And it didn't make me navigate my relationship a lot better. But anyway, yeah, we're at the end of the episode. It is a long one. A very, very important conversation. And I just want to say to you, dark skin girl, if you're listening to this, everything that you've experienced happened. It did happen. Everything. You're not crazy. You're not dramatic. You're not exaggerating. It did happen. And it did happen because of your skin tone. That is not you trying to conflate issues that is not you trying to dramatize something and don't allow anybody that has never walked in your shoes try to invalidate your experience the medium speaks about how a dark-skinned woman has a triple jeopardy situation in that they're not only discriminated and marginalized for being a woman but they're also marginalized for being black And they're further marginalized for being dark-skinned. It is not an easy road to travel. It is not. And if you are a person that has light skin privilege, and unfortunately I have to put it that way, um, whether you like it or not, and you have people around you that are dark-skinned, Please don't invalidate the experience. And also, please don't act like it's not happening because you love their skin. Please honor that the experience actually exists. Please honor the fact that colorism is something that plagues us as a community. And accept the fact that it really goes deeper than what the eyes see. It affects us in our workplace. It affects us in our relationships. It affects us in our friendships. It affects us even in motherhood. And obviously, it affects us with how we view ourselves and in the context of the whole world. I can't explain to you how terrible it has been to feel like the skin that I didn't even choose is such a big disappointment to others that they even make me carry the burden of that disappointment. And they want me in some, ha- in some way to justify my existence and to prove my humanity. Anyway, we're at the end of this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I just want to say to you, For everybody that has supported this podcast, I hope you understand that you have done so much for that 13-year-old girl that once stood on a field in a very weird school and got laughed at like she was a dog. You have done so much for me as a person and I truly, truly appreciate it. I can't wait to meet you in my corner next week. Bye. (laughs) 